everyone. This video is about the new Retivit RT82 dual band DMR handheld radio. Many people are also looking at the TYT MD2017, which is extremely similar. The RT82 is an IP67 rated radio. This should give the radio the ability to survive being up to one meter underwater for 30 minutes. Uh, I mean, in practice, this kind of immersion protection is done by using membranes to seal open areas like the loudspeaker and the microphone apertures, and then neoprene or other soft seals around the control shafts. In this radio, a close inspection shows that the battery pack has an inner seal that gets compressed by the chassis, rather than one that goes around the edges. This is a better arrangement because edge seals always seem to wear if the battery is removed and replaced frequently. Let's start by looking at the radio closely. The front housing comes with a screen protector fitted. Uh, it's one of those transparent types. You have the choice of removing it or not, but, but as it's 100% transparent, there's no harm leaving it in place. The left hand side has the PTT button, which is molded from orange rigid plastic with a black insert. I suppose it does make the button stand out, but it's rather gaudy. Below it are two buttons marked with up and down, and above the PTC is another button. The top of the radio has a bright orange button, the volume control and the multicolored LED. All these buttons are user programmable, so in the software you decide what they actually do. This also applies to two buttons on the keypad, P1 and P2. These can be assigned various functions depending on what exactly you want them to do too. In the centre is a trackball. I need to point out straight away that I absolutely hate it. It's too small to allow any precise movement. And if you use it to scroll down the options in the menu, you often overshoot. But the action of pressing it to select often moves you to the next item in the list. So with my chunky fingers, I need to use my fingernails to prod it. When you first power up, two options appear in the display. As it's a dual band radio, this could be a VHF selection on the top row and a UHF selection on the bottom. The exact function depends on what you've programmed in. At the moment, my radio has very basic programming in it. And on the top line, my display says DMR. And on line two, unprogrammed. Because at the moment, it is. DMR, by the way, is simply the name of the first channel. It's something I entered. It's not specific to the radio. If you move the trackball horizontally, it changes the DMR to DMR-B, then DMR-E, then FM. The names I typed into the software to indicate four channels I programmed in. All the same frequency, but no encryption, basic encryption, and enhanced encryption, something to test with the TYT MD380 to see if the encryption methods were the same, which they are. So I can confirm that the RT82 can communicate with the TYT MD380 with all the different levels of encryption, 100%. If you swipe the trackball down, it moves to the next bank. This is a real pain, because just picking it up is likely to change the radio to a completely new channel or bank or zone. Luckily, there is an auto locking system in the utilities menu where you can select the radio to lock the keypad after either five, 10 or 15 seconds. And then the front panel is disabled. Um, to undo it, you need to hit menu and then the star button and then it unlocks. I don't like that very much because the rest of the buttons are not that easy to accidentally prod, just that damn trackball. But at least there's a solution. I would have preferred a simple up, down, left, right system. The trackball is just too small and sensitive. Right, moving on to the antenna. The plastic on the antenna is not rubbery, it's just flexible and it's quite hard. It has an SMA male connector and that screws into the female on the top of the set. There's a direct plastic to plastic seal. There's no neoprene seals at all, so I'd have to question the IP rating. The inner is recessed, so screwed up tightly water ingress is unlikely, but the choice of resilient plastic means mine does tend to come unscrewed rather easily. There have been some reports of the TYT versions of this radio having some antenna issues where the user has removed the oddly shaped antenna and added a longer, better one. Um, this prevents proper seating and bending the antenna seems to snap off the SMA screw assembly. It's pretty catastrophic. 
on the RT82, the connector strength also comes from the contact area of the plastic to plastic coupling, so I'd be very wary of attaching any kind of aftermarket antenna. I can imagine a similar thing snapping off the SMA connector on this one. These radios are for portable operation. Adding external antennas reveals the lack of selectivity in the wideband receivers, so trying to squeeze a little more performance out of the little antenna I believe is pointless. It's perfectly functional with the supplied aerial. I don't intend replacing mine with an aerial that can break my radio. Turning the radio over we see the rear of the aluminium chassis, although it could of course be some other similar alloy. The belt clip directly screws into a substantial lump on the back of this chassis so it's not going to rip out. Now for the first curiosity. At the bottom is an orange caution sticker labelled GPS. Air pressure adjusting hole. Do not tamper with this or cover. Now I know that some GPS receivers also have an air pressure sensor so they can sense the local air pressure and then link this to the reported satellite derived height, but what for? No idea. The hole is protected with a very small piece of wire mesh and the battery also has a GPS vent and label. It's a lithium ion battery so we know they do swell up when overcharged or shorted out which might need a vent, but what on earth has this got to do with the GPS? I've got no idea. The battery pack has a double action catch. A larger clip is pulled which then releases the bottom catch. Seems quite strong and secure. Now for the slightly less common features. The IP rating means the radio does not use the normal two pin microphone connectors, but a flat 13 pad connector. It's very similar to the ones used on Motorola's and Kenwood's. The programming cable supplied with the radio locates over this connector and has spring loaded pins that make the contact and then a large screw to keep the connector in place. This is a sensible system to make sure water cannot get inside, but it does mean that this radio cannot have a normal earpiece or headphones connected. Although I didn't get one with it, I'm sure these will be available very soon, but being able to plug in all kinds of headphones or lug plugs is a useful feature that I certainly will miss. That's the rundown of the physical features. When you get the radio, very few of these buttons will actually do anything. In fact, almost all features are missing. You need the software to enable all the useful stuff. I repeat, as mine came, you cannot program anything at all from the keyboard. No frequencies, tones or offsets let alone the clever digital stuff. In this video I don't want to get bogged down with the digital programming side, but if you have brought this radio to listen in to VHF DMR systems that are using the usual colour code and slots, fear not, you can receive them fine. But if you have it to use on the handbands, that too is possible, but you're going to have to get used to the way these things work. The next video will show you how to get some useful data into your radio, so now you know what the radio looks like and what the various buttons do. If you're keeping score, remember the only negative so far is the trackball, and while I don't like it, I can't argue that it does get you to where you want to get to quickly, so probably I'll forgive it in time. See you soon for part two.